Hello and a very warm welcome to this video. I'm going to show you something today that is utterly spectacular, something that has lain hidden behind this title page for over 400 years. And no, it is not the geometry that Alan Green found back in uh, 2016. It is something entirely new, so please bear with me. I'd actually given up on this title page some time ago in terms of thinking it had anything else to yield. I had one query that hovered over, but I just gave up thinking about it. It was this broken R. It's the same on this edition, it's the same on the Bodleian edition, and on all the other Aspley editions from 1609. And given the accuracy with which those parallel lines were placed, the dots, we know they all join up to make this incredible geometry, it seemed quite impossible to me that that break was accidental or not broken for some purpose, particularly since it seemed that that rabbit just above it was looking at it and sniffing it as though to draw our attention to it. On the other side we see another rabbit who seems to be wanting to draw our attention to the A beneath his nose. We will come back to that presently. I have to thank Mark Lester, who is a high-level computer expert, who has been challenging some of the geometry and he's done that on his brilliant YouTube channel, and I'll put a link to it in the descriptions box below. It was my attempting to reproduce some of his results that drew me back into this title page, and it was from doing that that I stumbled on this very strange and interesting new find that I'm about to show you. Now, just before I go there, I think out of courtesy to those who are new to all this, who may be watching this video as the first video they've ever seen on my channel, I should just show what it was very quickly that was found previously. The man who found it was an Englishman living in America called Alan Green, and he worked out that this line drawn between the dot after the G and the dot after in printed serves as the diameter of a perfect circle. The way he did that was that he drew a line from the dot after 1609, right at the bottom, up to the dot after imprinted, and noticed that it seemed to pass through the T just above it. You see, as though the T is acting as a guideline, it's telling you to draw that line in that direction. He then joined those up to form a triangle, discovered it was a right angle triangle, and then found four other right angle triangles just by joining the line ends and the dots. Now, Mark Lester, who I've just talked about, has actually challenged the triangle that joins to the Aspley dot there, but it really doesn't matter as far as what we're concerned with, because you only need two or three triangles to form a perfect circle if they're all coming off the same line, the same diameter line. So that's what Alan Green found. I remember to this day when I first saw that, he posted it up online and I was absolutely staggered by it. I didn't know the import of it, but I could see it was something extremely interesting and I thought it might lead uh, to an answer to the authorship problem. I turned out to be right about that. I was amazed at the time how uninterested it seemed to me most of my colleagues in the Oxfordian movement were. But anyway, I took it out and I put it on the kitchen table and I got out compasses and, and rulers and all sorts of things. And drawing that great exploration, I discovered something that Alan Green hadn't seen, that if you were to draw a line down through the stem of that P, it not only lands on that dot by 4T, but it actually passes right through the centre of that circle. If we then took a line from the dot after the big G by G uh, horizontally and pushed back through the centre, we have what's called the chi rho symbol. That's the symbol of Christ. And you have to look at the uh, corners of the chi rho symbol and see where it's pointing. And you see that we are being told that the Shakespeare sonnets are by God, by G and de Vere. You can see that the fourth line lands on the dot by a T at the bottom just there. If you overlap this onto a ground plan of the South Cross Isle, South Transept of Westminster Abbey, you find it lands directly upon the monument to William Shakespeare, under which our hero, the Earl of Oxford, Edward de Vere, is buried. Now, I've covered this in a great many places. I think the best place, if you're new to it, to find out about it is a video I've put online called 
the incalculable genius of John Dee. I put a link in the description for you to follow it there. Let's get to the new element and let's start with the headpiece at the top. And the first thing you'll notice is that it is symmetrical. It's quite easy to identify some central parts of that symmetrical design and we can draw a line uh, through it. And first thing you'll notice is something interesting is that that line seems to be engaging with the material beneath the headpiece. That's to say, it runs down the line of that N as though it's acting as a guide, and it ends at the bottom, hitting the eye of the six in 1609. Look both at the sonnets where it joins to the N and the 1609, and both of them aren't exactly centered. So that gives us a sense that this is all a bit deliberate. I mean, look at the 1609. If you're going to center 1609, uh, you would put 16 on one side, no nine on the other. You wouldn't head straight for the eye of the six. A ditto with the sonnets. So something very interesting is happening and we're going to investigate that a little bit more. Now notice these S's, Shakespeare's sonnets. Um, if you measure them you'll find that they're in two pairs that are equidistant, the top pair and the bottom pair, the S's from that central line. In Latin by the way the initials SS stand for situs sigilli which means the site or place of a sigil, a seal. We all know that John Dee, who's made these encryptions, was famous for his sigil of Ameth, with its pentagram in the centre. I don't think we're going to get something quite as complicated as this, but it's worth bearing in mind. Now, there is another curious symmetry that is not so obvious to the naked eye, and that is the right foot of these two A's. The whole A is not symmetrical to the central line, nor is the top of the A, but just the right foot. And that tells me that it's being used as a mark for some sort of geometry. Is double A important? You bet it is. I don't think anyone would deny, even if they don't understand it, that double A is important to the sonnets. You only have to go to the opening page of the first sonnet, and you can see the headpiece above it there, which is made to look like uh, two A's. And if you compare this double A headpiece to the headpiece that's on the title page we've just been looking at, you can see that the title page very cleverly hides the double A. It's not so obvious, but it is there. I can sort of draw it out for you if you want, and you can compare that to what you're looking at underneath. So the double A is on both of them. What is this all about? Well, I believe that it connects the scholarly scriptorium, first under Edward de Vere, later under Francis Bacon, to God via Apollo, Athena, and the founding of the Temple of Solomon. But that's a long story, and I don't think we need especially to deal with it now. So given all these symmetries relating to the central line, how do we go about establishing the exact positions of the left and right margins. Obviously these horizontal lines are no good, they don't end with each other. The best place is actually up in the headpiece. You can see two flowers on either side, the far left and the right, bending outwards with a perfect little dot inside them. Very typical, I think, of D that he wants us to join those dots. I did a bit more than join them because I wanted to get the vertical as well as the horizontal, so I drew a big rectangle like that taking it down to the bottom of the two printed lines. The next thing I did was to box in all the writing there. Shakespeare's sonnets never before imprinted. I did it like so. So the line ran along the top edge of Shakespeare's and the bottom edge of never before imprinted. Now, remarkably, that is actually all you need, plus a pen and a compass, to discover what I discovered. And... I'm now going to draw it out for you. I'd like you to watch quite carefully as I bring a line down from that first A, following the angle of, of that line, see how it intersects with the centre of the bottom of the two horizontal printed lines, and then I bounce it back up to the right-hand foot of the second A, and, well, look, just watch and see what happens, and we'll talk about it afterwards. Isn't that amazing? What we seem to have there is an equi-angled uh, five-pointed star, a pentagram, and you can tell that it's meant to be there, that it's correct. You only have to look at the points where it's landed. Uh, so four of its points land on that square, very exactly. 
there's an intersection of two lines that hits right in the center spot and of course the fifth point lands very exactly there. A pentagram of course fits perfectly within a circle and it's worth bearing in mind therefore that we found our second perfect circle hidden here. But the question is obviously an important one. What does this mean? Why is it there? What's the point of it being there? Uh, what's the relevance of this to this particular title page to Shakespeare's sonnets? And this is where I think the whole thing gets pretty exciting. Now, I can imagine that a lot of seasoned Oxfordians will be saying, oh, I know exactly what the relevance of this is. Uh, this is a five-pointed star, and that was the badge of the Vere family. It was the only charge on the Vere coat of arms. Uh, this star has a long, long history with the Vere family going right back to 1098 when the Earl of Oxford's distant ancestor, uh, just outside Antioch, was visited by God, or so the legend goes, and God placed a star over him to wish him luck for a battle he was about to have. And ever after, from 1098 all the way through, this five-pointed star with its point upwards uh, was uh, the mark of the Vere family. Uh, but as you've probably noticed, the point is downwards on the one we found on the Shakespeare sonnets. Now, I know there'll be others among you who are well aware that the downward point, is what we call the inverted pentagram, is something uh, nasty. It's the sign of Baphomet and it's used by Satanists to get off on whatever it is they like to get off on. But it would be a great mistake to assume that the inverted pentagram in the minds of John Dee, William Shakespeare, Edward de Vere was associated in any way with Satanism. In fact, uh, one only has to look at an early image of the Baphomet to see it there with the star pointing upwards. So it was only recently that the inverted pentagram came to be associated with Satanists and with the Baphomet. Uh, these two images come from perhaps the most influential and important book on occult philosophy of the 15th century. That is to say, the three books of occult philosophy by Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa. The greatest expert on uh, Agrippa, modern expert that is, is Donald Tyson. He discusses the uh, figure there on the left and he writes the pentagrams around the hands are pointing downwards, which in the occultism of the 19th century is a symbol of Satanism. However, Agrippa would not have made this distinction between the upright and the inverted pentagram, nor therefore would John Dee, who was a very close student of Agrippa. So please do not assume that Dee, Shakespeare, anyone else were Satanists. That would be wholly incorrect. Here we see a picture of Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa, and what did he say about the pentagram in his famous book? Well, he called it a pentangle, for starters. A pentagram is a much later word, but it's the same thing. A pentangle, also as with the virtue of the number five, hath very great command over evil spirits. In other words, it's used to get rid of evil spirits, not to cheer them on. The interior pentangle, by which he means that, contains in it a great mystery, which also is to be inquired after. Now, as I say, Dee was a very close student of Agrippa. He owned Agrippa's books. He knew all about this. And because he was a brilliant geometrician, if that's the right word, he also knew that the central pentangle contained a great mystery. So back to my question, why therefore does he place it on Shakespeare's sonnets never before imprinted? What is the relevance. What is the great mystery that's hiding inside there? Of course, we know the great mystery of Shakespeare's sonnets, and that's to do with who actually wrote them. I'm going to give you a little bit of a clue before showing you uh, by joining up uh, the points of this pentagram, and you'll see it ends in a pentagon. By the way, look now at the first A of Shakespeare's. I don't think anyone can hold out saying that that was not deliberate, that both the downward lines on the A are acting as guidelines to lines on this image. So it is a dead cert that it's correct and it's meant to be there. Okay, let's get on and reveal the secret that is hidden right in the center pentagon there. 
I suspect you've already guessed it. It has something to do with Shakespeare and who he is and something to do with geometry. Obviously, all you have to do is connect up the internal angles. And what do you find but a five-pointed mullet, the sign of the Veer family anciently all the way back to 1098, the badge of the Veers. And of course, when you read the Shakespeare sonnets, you find endless innuendo in them about Veer's lines, his lines of heredity. And so that is not only extremely apt for the poems themselves, but for the front cover and the author of these plays. Now, I would just ask anyone who is still thinking of being vaguely Stratfordianist to explain what they think is the relevance of a five-pointed mullet to William Shakespeare of Stratford. Clearly, there is none. I consider all this, the various bits of geometry on this front page, quite apart from all the arguments about who wrote uh, Shakespeare's works. Just these two things deliver game, set and match to the Oxfordians. Just before I take my leave, can I prevail upon your kindness and patience to plug this extraordinarily brilliant new book that is just out, Shakespeare's Revolution by Richard Malium. I think it's out tomorrow or today or something like that. And it is the only book that puts real context into the historical chronology of Shakespeare's playwriting and shows what an innovator he was uh, right back, of course, into the 1570s and 80s, which is a period in which most Stratfordianists uh, have no idea that Shakespeare was even operating on the literary scene. This book has been written over many years by an excellent writer who has stood at the forefront of the Oxfordian movement since the days when I was in nappies. I couldn't recommend it more warmly. It's fascinating for everyone, whether you're a beginner in the Oxfordian thesis or you've been at it for a long time. Thank you so much for bearing with my advert, for bearing with my video. I really hope you've enjoyed it. I really hope that you'll share, like, comment, do all the things that people do to create a buzz of excitement. I mean, I'm of the view that it, it really is something special that I've put out today. Thank you very much indeed for watching.